So welcome to the next session, which is about new technology for new research, joint research activities. Uh, and what we are hoping to learn from this session will be about new technologies and how these can benefit the research infrastructures and also the importance of data access. Um, we will start with a presentation for Pat from Patrick Gorringe. Uh, and Patrick, he is a manager of international relations at the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute. Uh, he is the coordinator of EMODNET physics and has got extensive experience of coordinating marine data and you're also heavily involved. Are you having like a very long working hours? Because you're also heavily involved in national, European and international marine data projects, initiatives and programs. So Patrick, take it away, please. Thank you, Margarita, for that one. Nice words. Thanks a lot. Um, and thanks for adding that we're going to talk a little bit about data here and data access as well. So I also want to point to Hauke uh, in the previous session, in the previous um, panel, because you were spot on in your closing remarks there, in your own remarks, mentioning the importance of data, of standards, of data access and so on. And we kept talking during the coffee break, so we really got into some of the digging into some of the details. But what you did was basically you made the introduction for my presentation. So thanks a lot for that one. Um, so Patrick Orange, I'm based at the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute, but I'm here representing EMONET today. Um, thanks for the invitation, by the way. It's great to be here. Uh, the Arctic is most likely the most data sought area on the planet at the moment. It's really the most wanted uh, data hotspot in the world. So there's this big need to access more data from, from the Arctic. And what I'll present for you here is how EMONET is increasing the access to free and open marine data in the Arctic, but also globally. EMONET itself um, ingests data to one access point. It doesn't make the observations themselves. It rather pulls observations and data together into one place for you to use for your science. That's what it's about. Right, let's do a click, yes. And why not start with some, some uh, interesting figures, such as the cost of ocean observations in Europe. So we spend around 1.4 billion euros annually on collecting marine data. But only a fraction of this is actually spent to pulling this information together, making all that data available, um, and making it useful for the 1.4 billion that we spend here. And just to show you a little bit, to give the idea of the importance of the data, this is a word count from the UN Decade Implementation Plan. I pulled that one together to see, and it, I got exactly the results I wanted. Uh, it's pretty obvious that ocean and decade are like the most, uh, uh, the most common words, but then you also have data, and you have science. And the success of the UN Decade will not be as strong if we don't provide it with the data. There we are. Here we also have, just to, again, I think you all know it, but it's worth to repeat it. The observations really provide the foundation for the information, for the knowledge, for the decision making, and in the end, for the benefits of the public. So, Observations and data, that's really a core of what we, are, what we need to do and what we are doing here. Um, EMONET has been running for more than 10 years. Uh, when we started this program, it, it is today a program, it was a very fragmented data landscape of in situ marine data in Europe. There was a lack of integrated marine data sets very few open source data repositories. 
Um, some on national level, but very, very few on regional and European level. There was a total lack of FAIR data. FAIR didn't even exist at the time. And FAIR today is one of the key words that we are using when we are sharing data and for data interoperability. So we want data to really follow the FAIR principle that is making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. If we do this, we create interoperability. So that didn't exist uh, 10, 11 years ago. We were lacking harmonization, standardization, and interoperability. Emonet, with Emonet, we moved into a kind of collect once, use many times. So we wanted to pull the data in, but let users use this multiple times as much as possible. So the European Marine Observation Data Network, uh, we're a network of more than 120 organizations delivering a long-term public marine data service that is funded by the European Commission, DG Mare. It is a European authority and regional best practices in the marine data domain, and together with the Copernicus Marine Service, provides the backbone for, European, for the European marine data space but also contributes globally. It consists of seven thematic domains. You can see them up there. Geology, seabed habitats, biology, chemistry, physics, human activities, and bathymetry. These seven domains, so we collect data from these seven domains and make them available from hundreds of data providers. Everything you find here is standardized, harmonized, and integrated. Um, we have a central portal, everything is coordinated by Emonet Secretariat based in Ostend, not far away from here. Um, and it's not only European, it's, it's based on European funding, but we're also reaching out globally and adding global data sets as well. It follows Inspire standards, FAIR as I mentioned, provides searchable metadata, data services, products, web services and so on, everything to try to make it as easy as possible for you to access the information and the data you need for your research. It's moving into a new phase, Emonet. For those of you who are well aware of it from, from earlier, you know that each and one of these um, thematics have a, a one portal each. So you had to go and visit one portal for each of these different thematics. Now everything is merging into one, central portal, one website, where everything is integrated in one spot. Everything to provide a better user experience. It will provide one catalog containing the metadata and links to data sets and products, a map viewer where you can com combine different data types in one map viewer. It's already live, but we're still working on it. But by the end of this year, it will be totally up and running. And this is just to give you a little bit of a sneak peek how this can look um, really where you can, you can choose something from biology or physics or chemistry and you can visualize all this together in, in one view. Makes it easy. Um, when we've been working on this, we also bump into challenges. These are not Arctic specific, these are more general really, but some things that we, that we notice is that there's a lot of initiatives generating data, but not necessarily sharing those data, especially projects who come and go. You run a project for three years, you collect data, and after the uh, end of the project, they for some reason disappear somewhere. That is a big, big thing for us to try to get hold of that data and to make it useful. If anyone remembers floppy disks, we still find data on floppy disks that we want to try and save and pull in and make available. Um, not many have implemented standards for machine-to-machine -machine interoperability. And also, not that many have an open data policy where we really, we are promoting the CCBY. That's, this is a Creative Commons license that basically says that you can share, you can reuse the data that's collected. And also a challenge that we have is to better link to industry. Uh, industry 
also make, producing a lot of data. We want to connect better to them. But to do that, we have to know who they are and where to go and knock on the doors. And all this complemented with metadata. The more, the better. Now, that doesn't sound very exciting, metadata, but it's a key to provide interoperability of data because it refers to the information about the data collection itself um, and allows observations to be understood and turned into knowledge. So it's really important with the metadata part of all this. Sounds daunting. It sounds like that's a tough job to do, but it's not that bad because we can help you out. We have, within Emonet, we have a data ingestion service that is there to support you, to help you, to make your data available and to provide the kind of guidance needed to make that happen. We're there to identify, encourage, support uh, data holders around Europe and, and also the world to share their data by facilitating data holders to submit their marine data sets for publishing. And once you do that, we also provide safekeeping of these data. The point, they go to different data centers around Europe where they're kept for the future. So that's a very important thing that we do. We guide, we help, and we assist to make this happen. Following standards, best practices, um, and also linking to other existing marine data management infrastructures. Arise, I learned that today. You say arise. I work a lot with a colleague of mine, Antonio, who says arise in an Italian way. I don't know which one is right. I, I like Arise because it's a little bit more hmm, but Arise is fine with me. So making the ARC accessible for excellent service, and I just wanted to add that data part there, making Arctic data accessible for excellent services. And what you've done in Arise, you actually adopted everything I was talking about here before. You implemented FAIR. You use open tools for data handling, using common standards. Uh, another nice buzzword, AirDAP. Don't care too much about it. It's fantastic. It provides interoperability. You have a data catalog service at your network. You're connecting to existing data repositories, adapting these common vocabularies that we have. I think one of the most important things is that you added a data management component in the project. Um, I think this is something to think about. If you add that data management component, you can actually do pretty cool stuff. So here, from icebreakers in Arise, I have to work on that one, uh, via data centers, through geo networks and air dapps to the project, to Emonet. That's, that's how a very exciting air dapp looks like. But what happens when you connect this is really magic. This is what you've been doing uh, in the project. Part of it is this. So what we see here is data from three of the Arise um, partners. It's icebreakers, it's cruises, it's about 30 years of data both in both poles, so from pole to pole, Arctic, Antarctic. This is huge, it's, it's really huge. And I really want to give credit to my Arise colleague, Antonio Novellino, but also Vito, Vito, I think you're in the room, Ciao from uh, Antonio. Um, want to get credit to you who really uh, have been um, instrumental in making this happen. So this is, this is what happens. You, you adapt, you follow guidelines. This is, this is what you can get out of it. And it doesn't stop there because we have a, there's then an MOU between um, Arise and Emonet. So we take that information, we push it into Emonet, so it's made available for the rest of the world. This is a, a, a special Arctic portal we have within Emonet. So it's immediately made available there, which means it's open for the rest of the world. It also is a shopping window for the project itself. Um, and we, all, we did something similar down in the Southern Ocean through the Southern Ocean Observing System. So we have a similar kind of portal down in the south as well. So we try to have one in the north, one in the south, um, making massive progress in the Southern Ocean. People, I get new data sets every week. I want, we want to be in, we want to contribute to it. And we're hoping to get that same kind of momentum going in the Arctic. So 
within eMonet, we also, we're looking for all kinds of data to pull in. And looking at new data, new data types, I wanna mention cell drone. When cell drone in the very early days, they reached out to me, Antonio, but also to Copernicus saying, how do you guys want this data delivered so it reaches the rest of the world? So we guided them through the process and now we have sail drone data flowing in the system. Perfect. The drones is a challenge. I'm, I'll be listening a little bit to my colleagues here today about drones to see if we can figure out some data from drones. And we're also looking at connecting to existing wind farms um, to use them as platforms or to try to get the data from this, this kind of industries and to add that also to this big data pool. Other ways to increase the amount of data is to go to the indigenous communities, look at citizen science, low-cost sensors and platforms. Here's an example from the Umanak Polar Institute. They provide local fisheries on northwestern Greenland with a CTD. They put it on their fishing net and every time they go out fishing, we get real-time data from that particular platform. It's super cool. In the Mediterranean, they're using local diving communities to um, deploy small temperature sensors in the same locations year after year after year, resulting in, yeah, I will, resulting in 20 years of data made available. Or my colleague Kate, who's going to the Arctic in three weeks' time, bringing a bunch of sensors with her, um, we'll get all that data and gonna pull it into Emonet as well. Or why not something as easy as using fishing boats and putting sensors on the fishing nets? The potential there is absolutely massive. This is my last one. I end with a quote. This is someone taking bites of an elephant, but we are actually adding the bites. So we're, we take all our, you know, I, I wouldn't say they're very exciting, but the air adapts and we take the, uh, uh, metadata, we take the fairness and we produce this big elephant. Let's call it a data fund. That's all from me. Thank you very much. A data fund. I have learned a new word today. It's exciting. There are many things to learn, obviously, but thank you ever so much. Uh, we will move on in, on in the program, and I would invite uh, Thomas Gustafsson, uh, who will be talking about using drones and artificial intelligence to improve polar research. And uh, Thomas, he is a senior consultant at AFRI, um, a global consultancy service with 17,000 employees working with infrastructure, industry, energy, and digitalization sectors. That was difficult to say, sorry about that. I have not been drinking, I promise. Um, Thomas has a broad experience with unmanned uh, aircraft systems, drones. Uh, he has even tried to teach me how to drive a drone. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, there are some challenges, tasks in life as simple as that. Uh, but you're also focusing on radio communication, innovation, and system integration. Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, we heard a lot about data and drones, and unfortunately, or hopefully, I will give you some more information about data. Uh, so we know it's important today. Um, I'm representing the technology industry, uh, a, co a company called AFRI. So I will uh, give you some information about two of our work packages. Uh, the first one um, that we did during Interact 2 is uh, the drones in Arctic environment. And this is about uh, finding new applications through cooperation between uh, the Arctic science uh, researchers and the technology industry. It's about increasing the knowledge of drone technology um, and, of course, the very important legislation uh, for using the drones in the Arctic environment and uh, um, in these terrestrial uh, settings. And it's also about uh, identifying which drones and drone sensors that could typically be used in the Arctic uh, research. Um, and uh, also we did a best practice uh, for using drones in the Arctic research stations. So what could be the 
typical application that you can use a drone for. Uh, all of you probably have seen, seen one sometimes, and you can see it, it's a camera. Uh, that's the most typical one, but there are others also. Uh, you can use the drone for taking samples uh, of snow, of water, of air, or uh, any soil. Uh, you can have them for retrieving information or from uh, data from sensors that are mounted in very located uh, or remote um, areas. Um, of course, um, images, um, photogrammetry, which is making 3D models out of photos, uh, point clouds and building your own maps. Uh, use them for pickup and deliveries, uh, search and rescue. And um, the drones are a very uh, sustainable and cost-effective option to uh, um, traditional manned aircraft. <clears throat> One uh, uh, proof of concept that we did in uh, this uh, project was um, a snow uh, measuring tool or snow measuring uh, snow depths. So. What we have here and see in the picture is uh, um, a drone that is have a sensor underneath it, which will um, measure the distance to the ground. And on the other um, end of the drone, there is a LiDAR sensor, which is a laser beam that is transmitted uh, towards an ablation stake. Uh, and by identifying the top of the stake, and at the same time measuring uh, the height of the drone, we could uh, calculate the height of the snow uh, depth underneath. So this could be very useful in remote areas and hazardous areas where we are, for example, measuring the height of a mass uh, balance of a, uh, a glacier. Uh, and um, it's probably in the future where we can but you can say it's uh, more efficient to use a drone than by trekking by foot. Another thing that we did during the, this work package was a, um, a workshop uh, during a, our annual meeting in Svalbard, where we uh, uh, presented some drone facts and had some uh, uh, plenum sessions with different speakers. Uh, we had a small drone exhibition. Uh, we presented the studies from the achievements so far. Um, we also have speakers with reference cases. Uh, we had a round robin uh, station uh, with uh, um, a station where we everyone could be able to fly a drone by themselves um, to just release the make it easier for people to start for the first time. Um, we had uh, information about the, how to adapt to the legislation and typical one for the Arctic. Uh, and we also released a small drone pocket guide, uh, which is a condensed summary of all uh, uh, technology and legislations and safety in one small uh, pamphlet. Um, we have the important facts to be able to take the first step when, when you are using, start using a drone. Some facts and buzzwords um, and links for further a reference for further reading. Our other pack work package that we work with, uh, working with um, is um, during the Interact 3. Uh, it's client action making the data widely available. And this is about increasing the awareness of machine learning and artificial intelligence and how to use this relatively new technology in the Arctic. Uh, we did some pre-studies uh, and as you can see from the upper left uh, pie chart here, uh, the blue part, uh, dark blue part indicates that uh, quite few are currently not using any AI uh, during their research. And at the same time, we can see that there are plans uh, for using AI on the right-hand uh, pie chart, uh, the, um, the light blue one. Uh, so there is, this, uh, in fact, uh, an interest for, for using the AI. So 
Uh, we did some pre-studies and inquiries from research search stations and uh, identified what type of data set uh, could be questioned and answered. So um, it made us to explore possible uh, applications for the future of machine learning um, and with focus on uh, land, uh, land use, ice scapes, landscape and ecosystems. <clears throat> and also uh, the work package, uh, the objective was to using machine learning on some example data to uh, make more specific algorithms and uh, methods available and also ensure open data access. So the basics of AI, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning in uh, I'll start with the traditional uh, computer software. As you may know, um, all software consists of algorithms. We can call it instructions. Uh, and these algorithms are programmed by a human. But in AI, the concept of emulating and mimicking human intelligence is um, um, to do behavioral patterns, interactions, and sensations. And um, I'll, um, Machine learning is an approach of reaching AI uh, and by learning by, from data itself um, without being programmed uh, compared to with the software programming uh, where we set up instructions from human. We're letting the computer uh, uh, do all this experience and improving from, from, their, uh, from the experience. So deep learning is the concept of employing machine learning um, by using artificial neural networks. And these are uh, letting the computer learning by example and a little bit of neural networks. It's uh, like a similar to how the brain operates with its biological neural networks. And um, you can see similarities with the brain, uh, where you have in interconnected neurons uh, structured in layers. And uh, to, to do this, we train a network. Um, An example of this could be to use to classify thousands of images or large amount of texts. And after a network is trained, we could immediately get results from it. So, uh, the most difficult part is, or time-consuming part, is to train this um, network. But as we have it trained, we will get uh, immediately results. So we can say, well, here's a polar bear, it's a white bear, or it's a brown bear, or it's a bird, or it's a different kind of bird, or it's another, uh, another animal. So today, applications of artificial intelligence. You probably used any search engines, digital assistants, uh, for instance, Amazon, Google, Home, Apple Siri. We have um, more precise spam filters, uh, translation service, monitoring security. This is an example from um, social distancing detector. Uh, we can also identify persons uh, carrying weapons or carrying a banana. And you can see the difference between a banana or carrying a weapon. So I will give you a few examples of applications that we did for this work package. Uh, one was a logbook. It was an automated uh, digitization and uh, summarization to so compare uh, AI and human uh, summaries. Um, we know that there are a lot of um, handwritten notebooks and, uh, and, um, and notes from many of these uh, research stations from way back in time. And it's very time consuming for the researchers to go through all these uh, manual written books. So we scanned uh, a lot of this information and digitized it, and uh, the results indicated that uh, the performance of this um, 
artificial intelligence was comparable to those that could be from, from the humans. Another one was to classify animals from a camera foot trappage, uh, trap footage. Uh, so in long-term monitoring, we will get very lot of uh, images that are unwanted. So the idea was to classify uh, pictures from uh, empty animal or human. Uh, so this was very time consuming to do manually, but with the AI we could do it quite rapid and uh, uh, classify these pictures immediately. Another application was deep learning for iceberg detection using synthetic aperture radar. radar. Uh, we had information from um, or data from the Sentinel satellite, which is radar signals, and the radar signals are reflected towards the sea surface uh, or towards a ship or an iceberg. And by using AI, we can support the transport in polar areas, reducing uh, air pollution. And lastly, recommendations um, system. Uh, search and recommendation uh, tool for recommendation, uh, recommendation of texts uh, related to climate change. Um, we found there are around 10,000 scientific abstracts that would was randomly chosen uh, to become the data set for this. Uh, and it show that it would get some easier access for, for the scientists if they are more likely to read the information, or they will be, if they have more easy access to it, they will be more likely to read the information from these abstracts. So that concludes my presentation. Fast, Thomas. Thank you very much. Um, we will move on in the program, and we are on schedule. Yay! That's a good thing, isn't it? So, our next speaker, Griffith uh, Corsa, will uh, talk about who's giving where, who is going where, and how. Now I need to read. Bringing European polar logistics and infrastructure information to stakeholders. And Griffith is a pol policy officer at the European Polar Board. Uh, and the European Polar Board is a membership-based organization of European funding institutes, research academies, universities, and logistic operators. And you have got a background in sustainable development and international affairs, and you do have a PhD, and is a PhD researcher at the University of Lapland. Correct. Correct. Perfect. It's all yours. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's, it's very good to see a few of the faces that I've only seen online. Um, so I appreciate everyone coming to the event. My talk is not going to be maybe quite as technologically sophisticated as AI and drones, but it's in the same vein in terms of just increasing efficiency uh, in polar research. Um, and the, the subject, polar decks, has already been briefly mentioned by my boss, Renuka. So uh, I also want to thank Joseph Nolan, who's hiding in the back over here, and uh, without whom this project would never have been realized. So thank you to you both for sort of starting and supervising this. So the, the talk is who's going where and how. And this is basically our uh, attempt towards a database of polar logistics to help uh, increase efficiency and understanding of polar infrastructure uh, that exists currently. Um, and I want to refer to a discussion which took place just a few days ago that the EPB put together uh, about the rising costs of doing polar research. And a, a very, very brief summary of that is that as I'm sure all of you know, the expenses are going up, uh, whether it's fuel costs, equipment transport, that sort of thing. So Polar Dex is meant to help people uh, essentially 
avoid duplication of efforts and to understand what uh, infrastructure is out there so that there is not so much redundancy. Um, there we go. So the first iteration of this was a deliverable by uh, EU PolarNet. I hope everyone is familiar with EU PolarNet. It's putting out some extremely interesting tools and deliverables, including this one. There are catalogs outside on the tables. I would encourage everyone to take a look. Um, and this is, as it says, uh, a catalog of current infrastructure in the polar regions, provided largely by Comnap, Interact, and Eurofleets. Uh, this was seen as uh, something of a success, and so it was digitized and put online. We created the European Polar Infrastructure Database, and that has since been superseded by PolarDex, and that is the way PolarDex will look. Right now it's online. You can go to polardex.org. However, we're going through some visual updates, so uh, this is going to be live probably in the next few weeks of the new map interface, which is coming out. Um, and PolarDex is a, a map-based interface. It's a platform. We do not own at the EPB uh, very much of the data. The, the vast majority comes from APIs, which are fed into the platform, and which show, as you see here, the facilities uh, in the Arctic. Uh, we have partnerships with ESAFIC, which gave us the majority of our Greenland-centered data. Partnerships are sort of what PolarDex is based all around. We also have a partnership with Due South, Due South's uh, database of upcoming expeditions to the Southern Ocean was integrated in 2021. And that gives us a view of uh, routes going through. This is Antarctica. We have both poles. We have the 3D map, which again has yet to be implemented, but is in progress. Otherwise, I could try and give you a, a live tour of this. So this is just to sort of show you a brief tour of what PolarDex can, can give you. We have satellite images of the research stations. This helps give people sort of a, a more um, cartographical, I guess you could say, view of, of the stations where they're located. Uh, and we have station descriptions. Again, this comes from our data partners. This is from ESAFIC. We have uh, all of the Interact stations as well, uh, and a handful of others. We have vessels, and we also have aircraft. We're working on uh, putting drones as well. And this is just uh, a sample of the data entry screen where our members can put in data. We'll be doing another round of uh, data updates, so if you're one of our members, you can expect that in the near future. But again, to reiterate, we get most of our data from APIs, um, and we're always looking for more partners to integrate data into our platform. Uh, the previous presentation had amazing data sets that had happened previously. Uh, we are focused more on what's there currently, and um, I just want to say that on the subject of data harmonization, this is also an extremely important issue for us as well, because uh, different countries have different ways of describing their stations, the instrumentation that's available there. Different vessels have different capabilities. Um, and we are trying to push an effort towards getting everyone to report their infrastructure in a somewhat harmonized way because that it fulfills the mission of, of PolarDex in trying to increase the efficiency of infrastructure use, and it also just makes it easier for us to display it and provide a more useful tool. So I would like to say thank you to all of our partners, most of which are here, um, and I, I won't go through every single one except to mention as well Blue Lobster, who are sort of the technical masterminds behind the whole thing. Uh, and again, we have the infrastructure catalog outside. We also have these very small business cards with a QR code, which will take you to the, to the website. Uh, again, visual updates haven't been implemented yet, but the functionality is all there. So thank everyone very much for listening to my 
brief talk, making sure we stay on time here. Uh, and I look forward to speaking to some of you later. You don't have to go away, actually. You can just Should I just sit immediately? Yes, should. Absolutely. And I would like to invite the other panelists uh, to our panel as well. So in our dream team, we do have, you have already been introduced to three of them. You have been introduced to Patrick, to Thomas, and Griffith. So I will not introduce you again. I think that's sort of an overkill, even though we do have time. But I would like to introduce our two new, new panelists. Uh, we would like to welcome Frank, Frank Rack from, sorry. Ah, because I'm not... Ah, uh, Thomas, you should not do that. No, I'm just kidding. I should do this. Sorry. Thank you, Nicole, for letting me know that I was very... That was why everyone was smiling, sort of, yeah, this will be a relaxed session without her nagging. Thank you. Okay, I give it a new try. I would like to introduce Frank Rack. Ta-da! Our program ma manager from the Arctic Research Support and Logistics Program in the Office of Polar Programs at the U.S. National Science Foundation. Frank is responsible for facilitating projects requiring vessels in the Arctic Ocean and surrounding seas, as well as projects in Alaska. Felix Lauber has also joined us. Uh, Felix is the CEO of FL Polar Operation, and you have been to sea for 24 years, almost when you were born then. <laughs> yeah. And half of that time you have more or less spent on Polar Stan. Ay, ay, ay. Yeah. Uh, so FL Polar Operation provides education, training, certification, and ice management, all in line with the Polar Code. Um, I think we should start with our two panelists that have not given a presentation. So, Frank, if I may sort of uh, turn to you, and you know the red button there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, from a ship perspective, um, what is? I, I will give you two questions, if I may. So, what is the new ship-based technology that, that you're aware of, and and what are the technological needs that you're aware of? Yeah, I think we're in a transition period where uh, a lot of the ships that we've depended on for years are aging and they're in the process of being replaced and so as part of that it's uh, how to make ships quieter, l lower pollution, so different fuels and propulsion technologies, uh, trying to have them plug and play, so containerized laboratories, so you can provide uh, power, data, water hookups uh, for a variety of, uh, of different types of in instrumentation. I think uh, the lessons we saw with the, the Mosaic expedition was really there were hundreds of instruments and sensors and techniques that are being used, and, and really it was how to maintain and uh, keep the operations going, you know, with the shifting ice, with uh, changing circumstances from days to day, and having the technical resources and the communication technologies, so the space-based uh, store and forward for data, and I think we're going to see a lot more changes in the future related to that. And then other things like 3D printing, so you can kind of create uh, pieces of equipment that you need on the fly to keep it operational, um, and, and then really to support the science on the ice or through the ice or under the ice. So there's a, quite a range of different uh, techniques and capabilities. Um, what was the second part? The second part was the technological needs that is required for the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think one of the probably things we haven't discussed is just the coordination, uh, trying to um, transparently identify uh, requirements for different projects and scheduling years in advance. So, you know, the longer we can 
bring out the timeline to two years or three years, the more successful international uh, coordination can be. Uh, and I think that's uh, facilitated by um, you know, systems where PIs put in all their requirements and operators can evaluate that and work that into planning. Um, and I think we're, we're doing that, but on more of an ad hoc basis now, maybe, maybe more coordinated within Europe or within the U.S. through our, our national uh, or international fleet structures. Uh, but more and more of that in the future would really assist as we have um, more needs and fewer platforms uh, to really schedule. Thank you very much. I will now turn to Phil. Ah, oh, sorry, you have a comment. Yeah, yeah perfect. Just, of course, uh, please do. I, I like what you say about the um, research vessel coordination. And this is something that my colleague up here, Joseph, is also much aware of, that we are trying to look into that in more detail in Europe at the moment. So finding the, um, looking at future cruise plans and trying to merge that together so you can be much more efficient and by that also saving, saving money. Um, because that hasn't really been, been done. There have been, there are some initiatives, but now we're trying to take out big hole of that and try to sort that out in Europe. So it's on the way. Yeah, and I think one way we're starting to do that in the U.S. is something called the Marine Facilities Planning Tool. So it's a software based where all the operators can access ship requests and then put together a schedule. And it's, it's European software that we're adapting to the U.S. system. So there's an opportunity to go back the other way. <laughs> Sounds like an excellent solution, you know. Great. So, Felix, you're all awake. Perfect. Um, when I introduced you, I mentioned the word polar cold. Um, are we all aware of this? I'm not sure. So, my first thing, question would be could you please just let us know what polar code is? And then, in practical, yeah, what does it mean? And then, does this apply to scientists working in the Arctic region? Um, so the Polar Code is an international convention um, released by the IMO. Uh, the long title is uh, a Code for Ships Operating in Polar Waters. So it applies to ships <laughs> um, from a certain size, so from uh, 500 tons gross tonnage, where, which regular researchers do have. Um, and it's uh, for the regions of uh, uh, the polar areas. In the south, it's all around 60 degrees, thousand of 60 degrees uh, in the Arctic, um, as well excluded uh, Iceland and the Norwegian coast, so the area where the Gulf current cares for a less polar climate. Um, it was necessary because of the existing regulations, the uh, SOLAS for the safety of life at sea, the MARPOL for environmental protection, and the STCW for the training of the persons on board uh, did not meet uh, the polar requirements. And so in 2017, the polar code was introduced. And then, does this apply to scientists working in the Arctic region? Or is it just the operators, or how? Well, it affects the scientists, definitely. Um, <clears throat> because uh, these uh, regulations do apply for researchers. Um, and I think um, I'm pretty grateful for that. <laughs> um, when you fly through the polar code, you'll find some, some really marking edge corners, um, like uh, ship structure. If you remember 2013, academic Shukalski got stuck in the ice, 74 souls on board, and it needed four ships, three of them icebreakers, to get them out again. This was before polar code. With polar code, this exhibition would expedition would never happen. Um, 
So this is according to, to ship structure. Um, when you think about navigation, <clears throat> um, the navigation in remote areas, especially in uncharted areas or ice-covered areas, iceberg endangered areas, um, is made much more safe uh, due to the polar code. Um, and one point where the scientists well, at least uh, on the ships which go to the very remote and icy areas uh, where scientists are affected is uh, training. Training, knowledge, education. So what we do is um, we have our ship equipped according to polar code. So the ship is capable or the crew and uh, the people on board are capable to survive more than five days in case of an abandonment. Um, this needs training, training with the equipment, training in strong leadership, training in survival techniques. And this applies also to the scientists. Um, simple reason, in case of an abandonment, we come from a disaster situation, we need to calculate that the crew is significantly um, reduced in their abilities to lead a survival situation and it decreases the probability of survival of the complete group when we take the scientists into these scenarios. So what we do is <coughs> um, we take the leaders, the scientific leaders with us to a training uh, regularly on Svalbard for a week um, and uh, train them for three days, shore-based, and afterwards we put them into the polar nature with the uh, survival equipment and that they can show what they learned. <clears throat> there are some really nice effects uh, first of all, after this training, nobody wants to get into a survival situation. <laughs> so the behavior on board changes a lot. Um, and uh, the, the uh, educational training effects are also pretty good. So um, in respect of team building, um, strong leadership, and proficiency in uh, handling the equipment, as well as coordinating the uh, rescue scenario. Have you lost anyone on Svalbard? Is there sort of some sort of natural selection there? <laughs> uh, we, we, we make it safe. So, I'm, In fact, I'm just coming from Svalbard. Um, two days ago, uh, we finished our last training um, and we brought all 15 back. Wow, 15 there and 15 back. Successful uh, training course for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> I actually have one more for you, if I may. Sorry? I actually have one more for you, if I may. Yeah. Continue. Um, so you have how many years? 24 years you've been on the sea and sort of 12 on Polarstan? Very many years. Um, how do you envis envisage the future of research Icebreakers in terms of green propulsion. Propul you might have propulsion. to explain that as well because I don't need to know what that means. Systems, but I'm sure you can start with explaining that and then let me know what you think of it. What is the solution for the future? Um, well, the propulsion systems will mainly depend on the choice of uh, the fuel we put into the ships. And uh, well, presently. There are three options, one existing and two on the horizon. Um, the existing option is uh, biofuels. Biofuels, um, uh, two examples. Uh, biofuel might be created from uh, waste wood or uh, industrial residues. So the CO2 footprint uh, is significantly reduced by, depending on the kind, about 40%. Um, the other one 
my favorite uh, so-called uh, GTL, gas to liquid. So depending on the source of the gas, might be green gas, um, the carbon footprint might be reduced to half, about. Um, so uh, these are options which are already available. So you can, can bunker in, in Amsterdam, for example, biofuels from uh, industrial waste. Pretty good, price is significant higher. Um, but uh, the, the carbon footprint is reduced significantly. Um, the two options on the horizon are uh, methanol and ammonia. Well, methanol, you'll ask, why on the horizon? It's still existing. Uh, yeah, it is. Fuel cells are existing, not in the size we needed for icebreakers, but they're existing. And methanol is existing as well, but it's not available. So we are really struggling. We, uh, we do have one methanol ship in, uh, in our management, and we are really struggling um, to get uh, the methanol available for our ship. Um, methanol, I already said it, might be used for uh, fuel cells, for icebreakers. Amazing, because we have quite a lot of uh, waste heat so you can recover the heat and use it uh, uh, for uh, uh, the, the hotel service. And quite a lot of uh, uh, energy. You produce pure water and uh, some, uh, some CO2, depending on the source of uh, the methanol uh, the carbon footprint might be reduced up to 90% wow. with methanol. So um, this option, I guess, is pretty close. Um, we are uh, in close contact to um, companies who intend to build up a structure for methanol. I'm pretty sure it will come. Um, and uh, this is for the close future pretty nice uh, option. Um, the other thing I would rather say behind the horizon uh, is uh, ammonia. Um, right about uh, the same um, problem with the availability and additionally it's pretty toxic. It's hard to transport and it's pretty toxic. So it's also a question whether you want to have this stuff on board. Um, both of these fuels, methanol and ammonia, do have um, one quite big disadvantage. So if you go with a Conference Hakon or with Polar Stern, um, you need for an expedition about two and a half thousand cubic meters of fuel, three thousand cubic meters of fuel. With methanol, it will be double. So the new ships, which will be built for a methanol propulsion, uh, need capacities, well, let's call it enormous. Mm. It's pretty hard to get uh, this, these amounts into an icebreaker. Can they be on a little raft behind? <laughs> Just kidding. OK, but a challenge for sure for the future. Absolutely. So these, uh, these icebreakers, especially with methanol, <coughs> Um, are planned, are on the way. Uh, I do know about two big icebreakers um, which will have uh, methanol propulsion as well as for uh, fuel cells uh, and batteries. So you cannot, cannot uh, force a fuel cell, <coughs> a fuel cell uh, to take uh, quick uh, load changes. Uh, so you need a buffer uh, for, for that, and this will be uh, batteries uh, and uh, combustion engines, so multi-fuel multi -fuel combustion engines. Um, this is pretty close. So these two icebreakers, I assume the, the first one which is planned, I know about, uh, will be commissioned 
26 and the other one 28 about. So it's on its way, but it's not a straightforward, easy process, unfortunately. Absolutely, absolutely. And the, well, the, the major topic with these, uh, with the icebreakers, is uh, the area of operation. So even if we do have the structure for methanol uh, in Europe um, or uh, uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, we will not have it in the polar regions. Something to work on. <laughs> okay, so now let's move from the ocean to the land, if we may. So, Thomas, you represent a private company that is a partner of Interact. Yay. <laughs> How has it benefited uh, the science community, you think? I mean, you have given some, some, some suggestions before, but and also... How has this cooperation benefited your company? So what yeah. is the mutual benefits that yeah. you have? Uh, well, we had a very good cooperation with a response from uh, the community and the scientists. And during the latest uh, work package, uh, AI and machine learning, we, one of the major tasks was to uh, interact and to find ways to work with, uh, um, uh, with uh, data available from, from research stations. And many of these stations have a lot of data available, and we know that in the future there will be even more data available. So when it comes to AI, it's one of the key success to, uh, to have a lot of data and by that have new outcomes and new results. Um, I, I would say that we had, had a similar uh, cooperation with the drones, um, uh, where our work package have given support and inspiring uh, the scientists to adapt to uh, uh, new te technology and have them as a tool in their daily work. Uh, we also have very good experience with uh, master thesis students. Um, during the work package we had, I think it's uh, more than 10 master thesis students um, and they have all contributed very well to, uh, to these projects. Um, and it has made it uh, possible to, to give much back to the, to the community. Uh, and uh, how the um, question was benefited from, the, from the, our company, right? Uh, well, uh, within the Interact Network, we have a community where we actually meet each other uh, at least once a year. Um, not during Corona, though, but we have still meetings during that time. Uh, but I think it's important to meet, and not only um, uh, it's because you can just pick up the phone or send an email afterwards and uh, share any ideas with any, anyone that you met before. It's, um, you will see that some of the innovations and ideas, it starts with, with during these events, and um, it can be just as simple as any of the scientists come to us and say, hey, we have a a camera in the in a tree in a remote area uh, would be possible to to use images to sort out foxes from tourists. Um, so and yeah, um, benefiting from our company uh, when the project began in 2016, uh, 17, I think it was. Uh, uh, we have sev seen several spin-off effects from that. Um, just to mention a few ones, um, we participated in a project in, uh, together with the University of Stockholm um, in an active research station in, in north of Sweden. And together with other partners, we're focusing on measuring and predict snow layers, uh, climate change, and how this affected uh, the reindeer herding. Uh, and with the support from the drones, uh, we find new ways to predict these uh, snow, uh, snow changes and snow layers. Another way to benefit from the, this uh, uh, was an avalanche rescue drone uh, that we could, it was a developing project and we could use that drone to locate avalanche beacons that was uh, buried into, on, on the victims into the snow which could typically ha happen in, in the Arctic, as well as for researchers or any, any other tourists uh, 
working or, or entertain themselves in this area. So these are just a few examples on how focusing and collaboration within the Arctic has given us these benefits. And I would like to say about working with this Arctic uh, community in, in this technology sector, we have so many opportunities to reach out in, in media and in um, uh, during seminars and um, communities and newspaper. Uh, we are quite a large company. We are like 7,000 uh, employees all over the world, 100 countries. And everyone in this comp in such company are fighting with reaching out in media uh, because everyone wants to reach out and have their word spread. Uh, and one, uh, our media communication department, they, they love these success stories and uh, images and pictures of, of the Arctic. And uh, once they posted an article in, in LinkedIn, I remember, and afterwards they called me and said, hey, Thomas, uh, we never had any so much views and likes on any posting in our company ever. Uh, like uh, this one that you presented from the, from the Arctic that you wrote. So I know that clicks and, and uh, um, likes are not that important, especially when it comes to pollution and, and, uh, and uh, climate change. It doesn't care about clicks and, and, and likes. But at the same time, I think it's, it shows that the technology and the Arctic science is, is a way forward to collaborate and to make a change. So I think that's important. Yeah. Thank you very much. And it's so nice to hear that, I mean, we get a lot of benefit, the project, but that the company also sees the benefit of yeah. collaborating, which is excellent. And we just have to emphasize that we always have saunas at our meetings. It's a very good place to, to uh, come up with new brilliant ideas. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Never under, and underestimate the sauna. Thank and you. Not to, ma not to forget the, the icebreaker. The icebreaker, of course. Uh, yeah. And Patrick, you're still awake at the corner, aren't you? Uh, more than awake. You are more than awake. You're excited. Awake. Good. I'm yeah. happy to hear. Uh, I mean, as we have heard, you represent the polar data community, and you have talked a little bit about the data management needs and how important it is with the standards. But would you mind elaborate? I guess this is your baby, so that you don't mind... Yes, yeah, sort of. I, I just want to say that others here in the panel are doing extremely cool things. Uh, data management is a little bit tough to make that cool. Uh, we do try. We try to make it cool. Uh, we think it's cool because we see the results coming out of it. So we think it's a, it's a good one. And it's very important, too. Um, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit from my presentation, OK? Uh, especially when it comes to showing, um, echoing. And I did like that, maybe showing the, um, the needs, data management needs, where I was using the Arise project as a, an exemplar there, really ticking off the needs that really exist. So I had one of these slides with some bullet points on it. That is really where our, lead, our, our needs lie. Um, so we need to connect better to projects and initiatives, try to guide them. In, within the data management. Um, connect their data to European data aggregators such as Emonet or Copernicus or global ones. And really, it's a way to help to set these data free um, for further use for, for the, whole, the whole community. But it, with proper data management, it also helps to show projects results by visualizing the data um, if you add your data to something like Emonet, we also provide additional, um, it's like an additional shopping window for your project or your initiative by giving credit, adding links, and information on your activities. So you can be discovered from a much wider community by adding this information in. But if you want that, I'll go straight into the metadata part of it. Because if, if you want this to happen, the metadata is really the key. Another one that's difficult to sell in a, in a cool way, but it's so important. It's fundamental. 
uh, like I, I said in my presentation, it describes the actual data. It helps us understand the observations. And it, that's the key to provide interoperability. Um, it makes these different data sources speak the same language so we can connect them to each other. But ensuring data quality, uh, provenance of data, and interoperability requires three main elements, I would say. It's data formats, it's data services, and the key element, standardized uh, metadata. That's really, it's the one. I, I've, it took me many years to start to understand the importance of metadata, but it's really the key for all this. So data management together with this uh, sufficient standardized metadata helps to minimize uh, data errors. Uh, it builds trust in the data. So it really provides visibility, reliability, and security. But the trust is a big, big thing here. If I want researchers to use my data, they look at the metadata to see if they can trust it or not. That's where it all starts. So this is really a key component. Thank you. And I think one way of making it a little bit cooler yeah. might be to reward it better. Because many of the scientists, if you are evaluating applications, I've been to many different review or national councils review panels, and uh, you always look at the publications. Mm. I think equally important and equally graded should be, for example, data sets that are actually, you know, you get the DOI and then you can put it in your CV. Yeah. And I think we just have to elevate that into the research councils totally. so, that, so that you can then actually rather than writing an additional paper, you're making sure that all of your data will be accessible. And by doing that, you can actually get yeah. credit for it. Because the yeah. problem is, I think, today, that many of the scientists will not get the proper credit for it. That's, that's, that's uh, spot on. Should we aim for that? Uh, yeah, we, we yeah. are aiming for it. But just give us a little while, we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, we're, we, I think we're getting better all the time. Yeah but we can do much better on that. And yeah. I think that would be the kind of game change. Yeah. People feel that, okay, here I'm sharing, and it's noticed everywhere. DOIs, for example, yeah. is, is one way to do it. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, Griffith, you have been sat there and listening for a long time, but you are working on EPB. And unlike many of the national uh, organizations we have or, uh, or uh, companies, uh, you are a membership-based organization, yeah? Um, what are the benefits and challenges with having a membership uh, organization? Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I'm, just as a side note, I, I happen to think metadata standards are quite cool. So yeah. I want to say everything so far has been very cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I have to be a bit careful what I say about the benefits of membership because we have quite a few members here. Uh, we also have both of my bosses, Nicole and oh, Andrew, yeah, yeah. so no, no pressure. Uh, but it, the, the benefits of being a membership-based organization, and, and I, I want to emphasize that the men, member, or the, the benefits of being is slightly maybe missing the point in that we are the members, essentially. So the members are benefiting from being part of a membership-based organization. So the, the benefits, then, of being part of that is, I, I guess I could refer to our mission statement of uh, being the strong collective voice of European polar research. So sort of top of the list there is being part of that, being able to add your voice to sort of a, a, a collective voice to make priorities known to communicate with, with third parties. We have good working relationships with the European Commission, the European Space Agency. Uh, we, we meet other similar organizations. We just met with uh, AFOPS recently. So being part of that is very valuable. 
uh, we also have sort of formalized communication between the members. We have our, our action groups, we have our biannual plenary meetings, and I, I think everyone, it's just sort of common sense that the more you talk to similar parties, the more benefit you get. So we facilitate that. Um, you know, we, we, we have a fairly small secretariat, so really the power is through the members themselves. Um, and beyond that, we participate in, in projects. We're participating in several of the projects that are here today. And we can provide some additional sort of boosts in terms of administrative project management and communication uh, skills. But, but really, being part of the membership-based organization is sort of the strength in numbers concept, I guess I would say. That's, that's my concise answer. Thank you very much. Uh, time flies when you're having fun, obviously, but we still have some time. But I think I will open up the floor now to the audience to ask questions, if you have any. You're still awake? Yes, 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 yes. Let's, oh, sorry. Now I got really excited here. Please, yes, <laughs> go ahead. Okay, I hope I can keep that excitement up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, interesting. Uh, I'm Lars Pettersson from the Nansen Center in Bergen, Norway. I could, of course, uh, add different Arctic stories about EU-funded projects than we have heard today, but I'm quite impressed what I've heard, what you've been doing in the Arctic, uh, and what is the result of this project. However, when we looked at the maps showing data, the data are still very, very scattered. Uh, we are here to discuss future of research infrastructure in the Arctic, according to the screen in front of us. We are doing it in a room with ashtrays. Nobody has used the ashtrays, but when the room was built, it was natural to install them. So we have to think in bold way forward. Uh, as an oceanographer, uh, we, uh, in the 80s, when I was an uh, exchange student in, uh, in, in France, in Atkins, we would start discussing how to of increased observations of the oceans. How can we measure and get the real data? The satellites, the first satellites came, uh, but we need to know something about the vertical profile. Uh, I came back with an order to one of the Norwegian companies. How can you build a device that is measuring down in the ocean water column and go up to the surface again? Today, we have the Argo system. No, 3,899 buoys are floating around in the world ocean, measuring from surface down to a couple of thousand meters. Physics, biology, or starting with physics, a little more on biology and other parameters. And if you look at that map for the Arctic, it's empty. Or maybe there are five buoys close to the ice age. How can we expand Argo into the Arctic? And Aril, you mentioned one point in your last slide. Small project, can we position the buoys under the sea ice? Can we retrieve the data from the buoys under the sea ice? Then we will have a lot of more observations uh, from the interior of the Arctic. And if you look back on the Argo history, there's still as many research vessels in the open oceans as there were 20 years ago. And in the future, there will be still as many research oceans in the Arctic but the data density in the middle of the Arctic Ocean will be completely different. So maybe that is a bold way of thinking, so we can have some ashtrays to throw away some years ago, uh, some years in the, in the future, but uh, still we have then done really a contribution to what will be the new observing system of the Arctic Ocean. And then you can take the land in other ways, with drones or whatever. Thank you. Is there anyone who feels yes? I, I can give it a go. Thanks for that, because you're spot on. But a question back, do you know why there are so few Argos in that area? Yeah. What's, the, what's the reason for that? The Argo needs to surface every now and yeah, then, and yeah, when yeah. they surface in the Arctic, there is sea ice. So it's, it, it's, it's the matter of ice? It's the mat matter of ice, or seasonal sea ice. Uh, so we, we haven't, uh, we haven't so cracked what that. We, we need to develop the Argo system yeah. to position itself so you know where the, you are doing your measurements, and that you can do with acoustics, triangulation under the water, uh, in, in the water column, and you need some way to get the data from the buoy uh, to me, yeah, or you, yeah. or your uh, AMODNET uh, system. I will, I, will, I will take it immediately. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. 
Uh, okay, so it needs some so development. So the, the, the positioning and the data, yeah. and that, that needs some new technology, and the technology, to some extent, is there because the offshore oil and gas industry uh, are doing this on uh, positioning of drilling equipment, uh, of uh, retrieving data from, uh, from uh, uh, different kind of the production systems and so on. So it is possible, but it requires some new technological development mm -hmm. and that will work in the Arctic environment. Mm -hmm. Maybe don't link, be afraid, yeah. Yeah. Oh, linking up to some of the industry people then. Industry needs to be Detroit, involved, yeah. scientists needs to be involved. What are the data we need to be able to model the, the Arctic in the future and observe the changes? Frank, did you have a comment as well? Yeah, I think the, uh, well, the, the issue you alluded to is survivability. So we're putting out buoys, either airdropping them or deploying them from ships, but uh, it, it's the survivability. They don't last very long in most cases, or they'll last seasonally till the ice comes back and then the, their batteries will die. Um, so it's a combination of moorings, um, better technology for, for the uh, instruments that you, you can deploy, and then maybe smart cables under the ocean to, and acoustic systems that can help them to communicate. So it's, it's a combination of all, but it's, a, it's kind of finding the economy of scale. And that takes a lot of international coordination and industry coordination, as you mentioned, and funding. Thank you. We had a question from Vito first, a quick one, and then we have another one here. So I think we can squeeze in both. The red one. The red one. OK. So that I, I believe then we should be able to to, to, to separate, make a, a sort of organization of the debate. We have a lot of problems. So the scope of our observation, monitoring, investigation to increase uh, knowledge about the system, so capability to, to predict. Uh, we have, a, for sure, terrestrial and marine are completely different um, uh, requirements. We have a lot of forces. Just to move to Icebreaker, it's very difficult to make a international coordination because each vessel is a flag, and the country, of course, like to, to maintain the control of the planning, etc. So we have a lot of problems. We, but if we look at this problem as only one piece, and we need to introduce technology, we have a panel about technology, how we can introduce technology in this, we should try to, to identify the piece of the puzzle and look each one. If you look uh, around, uh, we are just talking, 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 but not taking. And we have a big problem at the moment. The increase of the price was uh, indicated, and this is in Antarctica was dramatic, but uh, will come also in the Arctic. And the situation, I don't believe the money for research will increase in the next year, for sure. So how we can manage all this aspect, for example? The, uh, I believe that we should try to frame some discussions, some points, and discuss on this. And for example, just to fix the technology, how technology can help in the, in the sea, on the terrestrial, uh, in which way can help us, the data. So um, it's, it's extremely important for me to, 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 to try to identify some areas and discuss specifically for each area. This is my, my comment in general, much more. Thank you very much. Is there anyone who feel, uh, no? We agree. <laughs> as simple as that, don't cross for too much. Well, like right. I said before, I mean, there's areas, if, if you can get science and industry or, or commercial applications to overlap, uh, then there's a lot of potential for synergy, and so with there, there was a Nordunet meeting a, a week, couple of weeks ago, I guess, where they're really looking at Arctic cables and how you can have dual purpose for, for communication and increased internet traffic and commercial applications, but also for sensors built into the cables and smart cables that you can use for for making measurements and collecting data. So, so there, there's some potential there. It's it's really trying to analyze the, the economic and, and the win-win prospect of how can you uh, 
design something that that people will invest in that will help you achieve what you want to do in terms of observations. Thank you. We had one last question. There might be more, but then you take them during uh, the lunch break. So, please. This. Uh, okay. No, uh, it, my comment was very much related to my colleagues. Uh, it is not only the matter of the water column, but also the bathymetry that is largely unknown. And the problem still is the, the coverage of the sea ice. So we should develop uh, autonomous uh, instrument uh, that can you know, work uh, while there is uh, the coverage. Yeah, and I think there's grand challenges for under ice vehicles, autonomous platforms, but again, it's battery technology or, or, or propulsion. Uh, how do you sustain their activities over, over a long enough period of time and, and have them stable enough to do multi-beam mapping and, and other scientific act activities? So it's, it's a grand challenge, yeah. I mean, the, the elephant in the room is that there's a lot of subsea observations, but they're military and classified. Okay, thank you very much. So now the next point on the agenda is the lunch that will be served outside. And please remember that there is a poster exhibition. So eat and look at posters at the same time. You can enjoy. I mean, of course, talk to colleagues as well. That's a good thing. But uh, uh, I would like to thank the uh, my eminent panel for this session and uh, say enjoy lunch, everyone.